This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. Welcome to Story Hour. This is our student reading. It's one of our special ways to end the season of our Story Hour in the library. We hope that you um, enjoy the readings today by our own UC Berkeley students, as well as if you want more information about Story Hour for next year, you can go to storyhour.berkeley.edu and see our full lineup um, once it's set normally over the summer. And if you have any questions, you can always contact us at storyhour.berkeley.edu. Now I would like to invite Melanie Abrams up to do our first introduction. Hi, thanks for coming, guys. Um, I'm super excited for this reading because I've taught many of the people that are reading tonight, so that's exciting. All right, um, Tara Fatemi. I hope I'm pronouncing it right. Tara Fatemi is a recent graduate from the English department. She has interned at McSweeney's Publishing and has contributed to six, 642 Things, which is Chronicle, Spectrum Magazine, and Bay Magazine. She spends her days writing, traveling, and talking to strangers. And she begins her career in advertising come June. Tara. Hi everyone, um, I'm Tara, as you probably know by now. Uh, today I'm gonna read the beginning of my story, Skyline Boulevard, which, was, which won the Crowther's Prize in Literary Composition, so hope you like it. Stand here, said Mom, pulling Matthew into direct sunlight. The shadow of the blue Vista Point sign grazed his cheek. Don't move, she added, backing away. She held up her small silver camera. Smile, she called out, peering through the viewfinder. Mom pulled the camera away from her face and slapped the jammed lens with her calloused fingertips. Damn, she muttered. Matthew rocked on his heels. He stumbled backwards, nearly slipping into the valleys of green below. He began humming highs and lows, swaying along the edge of the mountain. Okay, here we go, said Mom, masking her freckled skin once more. Smile. Can we send a picture to Ryan, Matthew asked, right as a car flew past. She looked down at the camera. You were talking, she confirmed. Stand there again. Matthew took a step back and stumbled again. Mom, he spoke hesitantly. Wait, don't move. Smile. Mom called out from behind the camera, snapping three photos in quick su succession. She straightened up and pulled the camera away from her face. OK, what? Can we? He broke off and pulled at the hem of his shirt. Looking up, he started over. Can we send a picture to Ryan? Mom's shoulders curved in, auburn hair falling forward. She brought her free hand to her face, rubbing her jaw. Her hand drifted to her eyes, which she rubbed one at a time. She inhaled and then exhaled, straightening up, inhaling again. I wouldn't know where to send it, babe. Only God knows his address, he mumbled, echoing what she'd said once, twice, three times before. He looked at his mom standing there, breathing. He tried to make himself taller before turning on his heel and running down the edge of the road's shoulder. The soft dirt sighed gently under his weight. He wrapped his excited hands in the bottom of his gray thermal shirt, rolling it upward before letting go to point past the Santa Cruz Mountains. I can see the ocean from here, he yelled. Mom walked up behind him, poised atop her pink platform shoes. Light sweat adhered her white cotton tank top to her back. The clouds, she said, correcting him. I can see the clouds from here, he said just as loudly. Mom was looking at the camera, cupping a dry hand around the screen, scrolling. Wow, yeah, she said. The shadows beneath her eyes were deeper than usual. Can I go up there? He pointed to a jagged behemoth hot from the sun. Faded graffiti rode its worn back. She gave him a weak smile. Sure, hun. do you need help getting up? No, follow me. Matthew strode over to the rock, placing his small hands on its waist. He hoisted himself up one blue shoe after another in the rock's deep-set wrinkles. He crawled to its edge. Mom slipped the camera into her back pocket and ghosted her son's footsteps, 
reaching the top of the boulder. She walked unsteadily towards Matthew and sat down beside him. It's hot up here, she said, wiping the sweat off her neck. The dirt from her fingertips stayed behind. Matthew put his hand on mom's shoulder. Her skin dampened his sleeve. She dropped her cheek to his crown, breathing, eyes closed. He gazed at the uneven valleys, each one more crooked than the last. I want to see God, he said. Mom silently lifted her head. He craned his head as far back as it would go and opened his eyes wide. They mirrored the clear blue above him. I want to see God, he repeated, blinking twice. Is he still on top of us? His words formed loosely, tongue slipping through his small whites. Thank you. Just kidding. I want to introduce the next lovely writer, uh, Anastasia Holland. Coming from a large family of writers, Anastasia has big plans of doing something different. Botanist, psychologist, professional snowboarder. But as she learned through meditation, there are some things, like thoughts, that we are just better off not resisting. When not surrendering to her fate, she enjoys running, reading, sunshine, vegetables, fishing, hiking, snowboarding, meditating, dreaming of graduation, and planning her 14-month trip to Asia and Indonesia that begins this coming December. Welcome, Anastasia. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm going to be reading an essay that's in the form of a list that the lovely Rebecca Solnit assigned for us. And it turns out to be one of my most favorite things that I've written. Um, it's titled, How to Be a Vegan Waitress at a Barbecue Restaurant. <laughs> one, lie. So much so that you begin to think that you do know what a beef brisket with the fat marbled in its center actually tastes like dissolves, melts, falls apart in your mouth like a sugar cube, you say, like a 14-year Glen Levitt neat. Disregard any negative self-judgment you experience at this point. Go with it. Let the similes regarding chunks of lard flow out of you. Two, or if you're not keen on that, I get it, ethics, morals over money, don't kill animals, respond with questions. Dad like 40-somethings drooling over the television and you with six bud lights glazing their eyes, Wedding bands visible as they clasp their seventh. Baby, what's your team? Tell me the Raiders. Chomping down on chicken wings, ranch dressing in the cracks of their lips. Um, you reply and point to the empty pint glasses you haven't picked up because you've been avoiding, well, them. Another round of beers? Lengthy armed, mousy moms with toddlers in Patagonia vests and snotty noses that unpeel crowns from their wrappers, break them apart and stuff them into silverware caddies and watercrafts trinkling and stomping wax bits into the hardwood floor, the floor you will have to scrub. I'm so sorry about them. They never act up like this. It must be all the sugar in all that BBQ. Licks her right thumb, then index finger. Sauce. Clear the half-eaten baby back ribs from the table. Balance five plates on one arm. Use the other to pull out their check and say, do I look like someone who cares about this mess? Smile. Drop the check on the table. Do not ask if they want dessert. Did you know tonight was the last kids eat free night? All right, a lie, but you can't be perfect. Chick who is rambling about wheat, free the gluten, who you may or may not want to befriend, but are too intimidated to ever do so because you have definitely seen her at one of those yoga classes where everyone knows each other except you, down-dogging and chatting, warrior two, and what are you doing tonight? Do you have any meat-free options? You. Uh, are you really hungry? How long would it take for you to drive home? <laughs> Three. When the dinner rush dies down, or maybe when it's still happening, pretend that you're someone who smokes. Four, tell your manager you're taking a smoke break. Five, take the smoke break to go outside when no one else is taking a break, talk to yourself, and eat a banana. Six, enjoy eating a banana without having to explain why you're eating a banana. Seven, flirt when the guy who is only half attractive in the real world, but in the restaurant world should quit and become a full-time model comes to join you. Eight. Realize mid-fake giggling, mid-suggesting hanging out after work that this guy has beef jerky stuck in his teeth. And all alternate realities aside, he does, objectively, talk like a male model, my dear. Nine, ask yourself, what am I doing? Ten, when working, never ask yourself questions. Eleven, disregard rule number ten because you know that you will never be a normal person who doesn't ask themselves an incessant amount of questions. Twelve, ever. 13. Get a Dixie cup and go ask the bartender to sneak you some whiskey. 14. When he says yes because you're skinny and blonde, realize that your self-awareness is not normal. 
14 and a half, you are not normal. 15, drink, chug to overstated realizations. 16, question your drinking. 17, snap out of it, stand up straight, feel your manager's hand on your shoulder because he too could start questioning your drinking. Hold in your breath as he starts telling you about the carnitas taco special, how he will get you to eat meat one day, Jesus. Give some sarcastic response, you're witty when intoxicated, and notice that his hand is now near your lower back. Remember that you're attractive. 18 and a half, ask the universe, why? Ask your manager if the guys from earlier are his friends. 19, check on your tables because you are, for some reason, a good person who cares even if Mary Ann, who yells at you for wearing the wrong scent of lotion, making you refill her coffee every two minutes, miss more cream, is doing okay. 20, when your tables are induced in a pork coma, staring at their plates like the only reason they are living is to feel just like that, hurry to the restroom because you feel dizzy. 21, a plant-based diet doesn't exactly help you out when coping. 22, look at yourself in the mirror. The barbecue sauce under your fingernails, your frizzing hair from pacing up and down stairs, your flushed face from the Jameson, lugging bus tubs, balancing trays, capitalism. Tell yourself that you will not do this when you grow up. 23, you are grown up. 24, but not really, right? 25, when your one friend who is like you, well, likes the same TV shows as you, walks in, you both stare at each other. So the soup of the day is? 26, go back out there. 27, your tables want their checks. 28, when the hostess tells you you're cut, you can go home, hug her hard. 29, scrub, scrub, scrub. 30, collect your tips, recognize the plasticity of the bills. 31, say no when homeboy asks you to go to Hotsy Totsy. 32, get in your car. 33, cry. 34, cry some more. 35, unlock your apartment door. Shit, you forgot your key, climb through the window. 36, walk into your room, strip naked, lay on the floor, stare at the ceiling, focus on the fire alarm and see its blinking light transform into a single grain of rice. 37, think of all the countries you'll be in in a few months time, where meat is a delicacy, animal sacred, where you will eat rice, so much rice, in solitude. Thank you. <laughs> Our next writer is Ishmael Mohammed, and he, Ishmael, is a second year PhD student in the English department where he studies 20th century and contemporary American literature and music. He comes to us from Los Angeles, California. Uh, good afternoon, and thanks to uh, the organizers for putting us together. Um, today I'm going to read from the middle of a short story in progress titled Everything Set in the Beginning, um, which is briefly about a young man who returns home after um, the death of his estranged father. Um, so here we go. When he first came home to the house, it was by himself. That was, a, was the only way he could be. Three hours after Cedar sinai phoned him, he arrived in Los Angeles to claim his father's body. That accomplished, he mounted his childhood home steps before anybody could disturb the accumulated, accumulated detritus of his family's narrative. That first night, he slept in his father's library, supine on the Persian rug that was by then ragged at the edges, shivering with his coat tucked beneath his head. The next morning, light filled the room early, but Wyatt was already awake at his father's antique wooden writing desk, which he'd never been allowed to touch as a child. He ran his, he his hand along its grooves and pressed his fingers into, into them so that splinters punctured his skin. His father had carved his name grimly into one corner, Franklin Evans. Books lay open the, the way paramedics left them after moving the body. Not the heavy law books, but the dog-eared anthropological tomes. The man was a lawyer by trade, but an amateur race man in his, in his retirement. A few notebooks were scattered across the desk, with legible notes scribbled from margin to margin. When legible, they were little more than slogans. Black man was original man. Black man came to America before the white man. Wyatt knew them by heart. They were the same factoids his father drilled him on when he caught Wyatt reading Metamorphosis or The Sun Also Rises or anything his parents hadn't personally bought him from Zara's bookstore. It was difficult not to imagine the old man slumped over his desk after the heart attack 
his prosperous, plump body shivering, but his hands still clasping those books. Wyatt opened the, the desk drawers to survey his inheritance. More books, old legal notes frayed and turned yellow with age, correspondence to and, to and from clients, everything arranged into neat stacks with no discernible logic. He didn't have the patience to read or catalog anything, just removed everything drawer by drawer, two hands at a time, until the room was dense with the curdled scent and the floor disappeared beneath stacks of paper. He moved swiftly, but it took him a long time, and when he came to the last drawer, it was noon. The last one was jammed and wouldn't open completely. He reached back into the drawer and removed another book, different this time, a photo album, unfamiliar. Flipping through it, he looked into the hallway every so often, half expecting someone to step through the entrance and join him. The album was filled with people he didn't know, and a few who he did. Men, mostly, bronze-colored and clothed in dingy work clothes and smartly tailored Sunday suits, smiling gritty forced smiles beneath faded sunlight. On one page, Wyatt recognized a young Franklin grinning next to a few other men, their, um, a few other men preening like they expected the photo to end up in jet and not a dead man's drawer, his brothers. They all raised calloused hands up to the camera with evident pride. Franklin's figure looked meager beside his brother's hulking bodies. He was a full foot shorter than the others, but as if to make up for it, his body was captured mid-stride with short arms flexed and booted feet lunging towards the unseen photographer, as if he was tired of waiting and threatening to grab the camera, take the picture himself. His broad face had already acquired the scowl that marked Wyatt's memory. His eyes sat deep and hard beneath a slightly protruding forehead, forehead, expressive of nothing besides determined and eager aggression, not directed at anyone in particular, just the way he and his brothers had learned to approach the world. The old gas station they'd owned before fleeing Detroit sat in the background with the, with the red, white, and blue awning over the shop proclaiming simply gas beneath a smattering of, of birds. Weeds already grew up around the four pumps at which a few customers looked, looked on and filled up their Cadillacs and Lincoln Continentals. In the photo's back, the same careless handwriting from the notebook stated, Detroit, 1973, me, Ralph, Thomas, Dutch at station. The day passed like that. Wyatt looked through photos of men who clothed their feet in suits, sharp hats and wingtip shoes, though their callous hands still showed men who worked at cement factories or car plants or construction sites, and when that was done, went home to no comforts in particular, besides maybe dimly grateful families, meals warmed over on the stove, familiarly grooved couches and Stevie Wonders or Sam Cooke's voice sometimes when the radio worked and they felt like doing something more than lying in bed, hoping that the throbbing behind glazed eyes would recede or at least dull. When he was done, it was near dark and he set the book down without much noise. Half the sun bobbed orange just above the horizon. Thank you. Um, thank you. Next, we have Miles Osborne. Uh, Miles is a fourth year undergraduate from Rochester, New York. He writes fiction and nonfiction, or at least he tries. Miles. Thanks, Ishmael. Um, today is supposed to be a day for all the award winners, but I didn't win any awards, so thank you to the award winners, to our coordinator Laura and also Melanie Abram for letting me crash the party. Um, what I'll be reading from today is a story called Recent Appraisals. Uh, it's about a real pig with some uh, self-control problems. When Cheryl Bixby found Richard online, she must have read his old credentials and thought he was still with the art history department at the University of Pennsylvania. It was a problem he was not quick to correct. For a few nights, they'd exchanged emails and updated photos, but before Richard could explain his professional transition, she'd arranged to drive up to Buffalo. There was a collector of miniature kerosene lamps that required an appraisal. Cheryl told Richard she preferred local work, but eBay had all but swamped her decorative antiques business. They parked her Jetta in the snow and handled the Polish widow's lamps, carefully inspecting the shafts and bulbous porcelain shades. There were a few that Cheryl said she wanted for the shop, but the widow wouldn't budge on pricing, so they'd driven back to the Econo Lodge on Transit Road and fucked with the heat turned off. On the ride back to Pittsburgh, 
Richard asked Cheryl to leave him at the Amtrak station downtown, but she parked first, and because there was time before he'd said his train would depart, she said they should kiss. He followed directions, tilting the seat back. But when she took his big brown coat buttons in her hands and started unfastening them, he told her he was, ta he was TAing an 8 o'clock class in the morning. She frowned and nodded, and he crossed the street and stood with his luggage under Daniel Burnham's brownstone rotunda, watching Cheryl's Jetta drink, shrink down Liberty Avenue, across the Monongahela, and toward the western suburbs where she shared a yellow split level with her husband, Brad. Hearing the clattering of station bells, Richard watched for the train. It was a double-decker with soot flattened side panels. One of its doors stopped in front of him and opened, but he didn't board. He waited for the train to depart before crossing back over the garage bridge, hurling his luggage into his hatchback and heading off in the same direction as Cheryl. Since the start of his hiatus from Penn, Richard had quietly worked two jobs meant to aid the completion of his dissertation. The first necessitated his move to Pittsburgh and in many ways resembled teaching. Docenting at the Falling Water House and Museum meant spending five afternoons a week in the subject of his scholarly study. Yes, he was required to provide heavily abridged tours of Frank Lloyd Wright's Pennsylvania masterpiece, but what was an hour in a place Richard had failed to absorb in three years? When the tours were through, he deposited guests in the gift shop and listened to their comments from the adjoining docents' lounge. More than all the others, docents. He was described as fantastic, kind, clever, and keen, and he'd begun carrying two coffee cups for tips because he'd found that the first one often overflowed. His other work was at Sears, where he covered the sales floor during night shifts and sold appliances to working people who couldn't make the regular daytime hours. A former elementary school art teacher with a dyed mustache shared the same routine. Aside from falling water, Charles worked the jewelry counter at Sears and had gotten Richard his sales position after he'd caught him with an apple for lunch. Removing a panini from its noisy paper wrapping, Charles had handed Richard half and said, I'll tag you back later. Besides him and Charles, the other docents were all retirees, sad, costumed, jewelried women whose social circles had migrated south without them. They had no expert knowledge, and when they were together in the docent lounge, any mention of architecture roused little enthusiasm. They recited facts from cue cards to keep from reflecting on their own degeneration, and Richard believed that they admired him for transcending that same slump. The enthusiasm with which so many of them had invited him into their, their homes confirmed it, as did their eagerness to listen, to offer him their bodies, and how afterwards, on their dead husband's beds, they cackled over loud, delighted to spend time with someone so much younger and who wasn't their grandchild. Richard was surprised by the pleasure he took from these encounters. They certainly didn't supplant his time with Cheryl Bixby, but the way he was able to offer them so little while imparting so much, the sort of reverence was an emerging comfort. Once at Sears, he'd let Charles drop him off in the handicap stall. This was apparently his tag back. It wasn't so bad. Charles wasn't clammy. He didn't look him in the eye with that sad fuck me face. His mustache didn't bristle against his lower abdomen. It was soft. But when Charles had finished, Richard had slapped the paddled handle of the handicap faucet and watched the water rise in the sink basin while, he, while Charles tucked in his shirt and left. Richard knew how it would go from now on. They would continue their work in separate departments, maybe acknowledging each other when they were both responsible for transferring cash boxes to the central safe, but a certain knowledge now belied their interactions. Like his encounters with the other docents, Richard knew Charles was desperate, and Charles now knew whatever he knew about Richard. His time with Cheryl was different. What she knew about him and what he actually was were separate entities entirely, and that was now, and that was how it would have to remain. Richard was walking the sales floor on a Monday in April, tired but still invigorated from Buffalo, when Cheryl's husband, Brad, passed through the automated doors and waved. In Sears' sterile fluorescent glaze, he looked gray. The Bixby's current oven was having ignition troubles, a $15 fix Richard wasn't about to explain, and the first question Brad asked was whether or not his wife could still smoke if their condo began filling with gas. Leading Brad around the showroom, Richard had reassured him, comparing the dimensions and specs of competitively, competitively priced models, detailing the financials, the Sears limited warranty. He covered the safety features, which for a budget brand were multitudinous and surprisingly comprehensive, and they agreed that Ms. Bixby and her parliaments would only be safe when their new Amana was installed. Brad leaned over the counter while Richard penciled the details onto a two-ply paper receipt. He asked if Richard had a wife, 
And when a response didn't come, Brad corrected him, self. Or a partner, do you have a partner? He said, smiling. Let me tell you, I'm an ally of alternative lifestyles. <laughs> no, Richard said, I'm, ma I'm not married, but there is a woman, so you understand how it is. And she's a hard ass, Brad grinned. I see it in you. And Richard didn't know how to respond to that. He could have told Brad about any moment in his life with Cheryl, starting with the nearly three semesters as undergraduates when they had been involved. He could have said how they had been in the same year, the same art history classes, how they proofread each other's papers in bed, and how he remembered trudging through a 15-pager on the Prairie School, all of it with her toes in his mouth. How on the breezy yellow autumn afternoon, she returned early from laps. It was him and an American Sign Language major that she found in their shower. How she chased them out before he could grab anything more than a hand towel. How he had left behind a mustard colored briefcase with brass clasps, which he'd bought him thinking it was the perfect gift for a man just admitted to the PhD program at the University of Pennsylvania, and how through a half-decade marriage and a rapidly dissolving business, Cheryl had kept the case and returned it one night in Buffalo that should have never, ever, ever have happened. Thank you. <laughs> Up next, uh, we have Claire Rogerson. Claire was born and raised in Chicago and moved to the Bay Area in 2009 to attend UC Berkeley. She'll graduate this spring with a degree in English and creative writing. Come up, Claire. Uh, hi, I'm gonna read the beginning of my story. It's called Face Paint. The road is made of a kind of mud she's never really seen. Thick as tar and a deep dark brown that smells like shit and the earth. It mixes with the wet bright, ripe with the wet ripe air forming something noxious that seeps in through her nostrils and sinks into her guts. Smoke, rotting flowers, and leaves. They set off early. The jeep came at 5 a.m. before it was even light out, and the sky's still gray. It's a long drive, and they have to get there before it's dark to unload all the climbing equipment. It's her and two families placed together on the trip, one from Chicago and one from Florida, and Nick, their guide, who makes a brief introduction in the hotel lobby before they all pile in. I'm Angela, she tells them, and they pity her because she's young and alone. I'm a travel writer, and they look impressed, eyeing the big camera that sits on her hip. She sits up front, and the families sit crowded together in the back. They fall asleep quickly, but she stays awake with Nick while he drives. He has a soft voice and a kind of physical authority uh, that makes her feel safe despite the speed and the pot-marked road. She sees guides all the time, and most of them are afraid of silence, always talking, always entertaining. She, rel she relishes his silence. Hours pass and the road unspools in wide sweeping turns, revealing valleys yellowed with ripe corn and coffee fields full of fragrant berries and low spindly arms. The green is only interrupted by the occasional fallow fields, their furrows snaking down the hillsides, dilating and receding, rippling like corduroy. Banana trees and thickly flowering acacias line the road. Small fruit stands with tin roofs tucked into their shady folds. Tree branches thwack and brush up against the sides of the Jeep, and when they drive through villages, people wave and thrust baskets up against the window. Boys and men roll along beside them on the highway on bicycles, and women trudge barefoot in groups wrapped in swirling reds and greens and pinks, plastic bags balanced on their heads. There's a kind of rhythm to the ground, the patterned earth stretching out in all directions. She's taking snapshots, but none of them look quite right beneath the shade of her hand. It looks more African than she expected. She knows that sounds bad, but she can't find a way to articulate, even to herself, what she means in a way that doesn't make her cringe. She hadn't expected the women to be carrying things on their heads or to be wrapped in colorful cloth. What did she think it would look like here, she tries to remember. What image did she have of this place, of Africa, of Tanzania, when she had agreed to stop covering Europe, to stop writing up bistros and art festivals and bike and beer tours to come here? She can't parse it out, and she tries to go back to just looking. I'll write later, she thinks. I'll write about it later. After hours of snaking along, the dirt road turns into asphalt, and the rolling hills sink into empty, flat plains with high, pale sky and a burning sun. All the people are gone now. It's just grass stretching endlessly in all directions like a scrubby yellow ocean. The, same, the sameness makes it hard to stay awake, and she's finally being lulled into sleep. But then she sees him. At first, she thinks she's dreamed him up. They're approaching a dry stream bed, and sitting on the bridge is a boy no older than 13. His face is painted white in crosses, sharp triangles, and plunging curves. He's wrapped in a black robe holding a staff, and he's hunched over on the metal bars of the bridge, staring at them, completely still. As they get closer, she sees two more boys, also in black robes and thick white paint, swaying just a little in the wind, not speaking, nothing, 
just standing at the edge of the highway, silhouetted against the endless scrubby plains and the dusty horizon. Nick, her voice cracks. She realizes she hasn't spoken in hours. Yes? Nick, who is that, she asks, her heart racing despite herself. Maasai boys, after they're circumcised, uh, they're exiled and they have to be alone out here for months wearing the black and face paint. When they heal, they're allowed to come back and get wives. That's so sad. It slips out before she has a chance to check herself. It's not sad, she corrects herself. It's different. It's OK, the ceremony's not so good. When they make the cut, the boys are not allowed to make a sound or they're shamed for the rest of their lives. And the healing out here alone is long. But when they get back, they don't have anything to do. They, they used to fight to be warriors, but today, who would they fight? They get wives to cook and clean, and the younger boys tend to the cattle. The men mostly just barbecue, he laughs. They're approaching the boys fast, but when they reach the crossing, they slow down. She's close now, and she can see how young they are, not more than 13. There's still a roundness in their cheeks underneath the paint that's thick as plaster. She locks eyes with the boy draped over the rails, and the hardness in his gaze hits her like a brick. She can't see herself in them. She doesn't recognize what stares back. They start to pull past him, and then she hears a blood-curdling scream from just behind them. The families wake with a start, and the fathers grab out for the children, and the youngest ones are startled for a moment, and then they start to cry. Nick reaches out for her hand, and looking her in the eye, perfectly calm, he tells her to stay calm, to stay in the van, and grabbing a rifle snaps, stashed beneath his seat, he steps out and disappears behind the car. The luggage is piled so high in the back of the Jeep she can't see a thing, and everyone is huddled together, and the only sound is men yelling in a language that none of them understand. After a few minutes, Nick comes back around the side of the car and opens the doors. OK, everybody, don't worry. Just a slight delay. One of the boys got his foot caught under the wheel of the Jeep, and the wheel went over it, and maybe it's broken. It has to be crushed, she thinks. All the, all the bones in his foot are going to be crushed. He's going to need surgery. I'm going to go back and speak to them a moment longer, and then we'll be on our way. We have to take him to the hospital, she blurts out. Nick gives her a pitying look. Thank you. Uh, next up is Michael Shaw. Michael Shaw is a junior English major who came to college later in life after a career in management and marketing. He grew up on the Big Island of Hawaii and now lives in Walnut Creek with his wife, Quinn. He also won the Cook Prize for Poetry and is working on a novel. Thank you. It's such an honor to be here and uh, be amongst such good company. I'm going to read from my short story, a, a section of it. The uh, story is called His Return, and it won the Crothers Prize this year. Uh, this is a ghost story told from the perspective of the ghost and how that drifts away from horror into tragedy. A hand clamped down onto Andrew's right shoulder. Cold pain shook through his body. The man's hand felt like a 1,000 pounds of ice water. It was too much weight to bear. He said, you don't belong here. Let go. Let the past go. Erica had said the same thing in the car. Let go. She laughed as she pulled the bag of potato chips out of Andrew's hands. Focus. He turned his eyes to the mountain road, put both his greasy hands on the wheel, then opened his mouth comically wide and made biting motions. She smiled and took some chips from the bag, placing them one at a time into Andrew's mouth. Om nom 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 nom. He chewed with his mouth open. Feed me. Erica rolled her eyes and laughed. Her sun-kissed cheeks were beautiful. Why couldn't he go back there? What was wrong about wanting to go back to laundry and gardens and roller coasters and potato chips? But every time, her smile suddenly dropped and she screamed. Every time, Andrew looked at the road and saw a car broken down in the lane. Every time, he swerved around it, but their car slid sideways and began to spin. Why couldn't he do anything? His knuckles were white on the steering wheel and he struggled with it. The world was a blur around him. The brakes were locked. Turn into the spin? Away? Gas? Break? Emergency break? He wanted to pull everything, do anything. The voice said, let go. No, hang on. The seatbelt cut into his neck. The car smashed into the guardrail, and breaking the metal with a shriek went off the edge of the road, flying through the air towards a ravine. His heart was in freefall. Glass flew everywhere. A shard hovered in the air in front of his face, no bigger than a fingernail. It slowly spun in front of him, revealing its blue edge. And through that tiny shard, he saw Erica screaming. She was trying to grasp at anything that would make this stop. He wanted to reach for her, to help her, but he only had time to look from the glass shard to the ravine and blink once. Andrew opened his eyes. He was back on the living room floor. The weight was crushing him. The blue-eyed man was standing above him, bathed in light from the TV. The man stared at Andrew, who was looking at Erica, who was watching TV and taking no notice at anything. Andrew's voice was hoarse. Erica, 
What are you trying to accomplish? The man asked. Andrew crawled towards her. I'm sorry, I just wanted to help you. She smiled at the TV. Erica, listen to me, I came back for you. Andrew reached out to grab her chair, but his hand passed through it. His mouth dropped open and his eyes grew wide as he tried again and again to touch the chair, anything around him. Panicked, he said, what did you do to me? I've shown you the truth. Focus on what is right in front of you. Andrew clenched his fist and looked at Erica. Tears were welling up in his eyes. This is all my fault, the man said. I do not deal in blame. He stepped into Andrew's view and said, look into my eyes. Andrew looked at the man through blurry eyes and took a deep breath. The world began to fade away. He wanted to do something to make things right, to come home and help her, to wash dishes and do laundry and take her away from this. The man said, let go. This time you have to let go. Andrew could feel the weight, heavier than ever before. It was crushing him, pressing his existence into nothing. Those blue eyes grew and grew until they were an infinite universe filled with uncountable worlds, bright sparks of time and hints of life, red and green and blue, life that's ripe with potential. In a cycle of immeasurable energy, he could feel the weight, spiritual gravity emanating from those eyes, pulling him off the edge. Andrew couldn't hold on. He fell in. Thank you. Up next, we have Devin Simpson. Devin is a third year English major and theater double major. She's an aspiring actress who loves po slam poetry, Sondheim musicals, reading too much, exploring Berkeley for interesting ice cream flavors. One day, she hopes to travel the world and write a story for every place she visits. Give it up for Devin. Hello, um, I wanna say thank you so much for having me. This is a story, I'm gonna start kind of at the end. It's about a couple who goes to Rome hoping to reignite their romance. And the wife, Marion, has decided the best way to do this is to search through the city looking for a romantic first kiss. And at this point, she has climbed atop a ladder hoping for her love to catch her. Come on, catch me, she called to him, swinging out so that one side of her body was splayed against the night. Marion, don't be ridiculous, come down. Three. She smiled at him, actually excited by the idea of his arms around her, catching her. I won't, so don't jump. He folded his arms. Two, she wanted to do this with him. Marion, don't. One, she jumped. Julian didn't get there in time, but she only fell a few rungs, landing with both feet on the ground. The impact of her stockinged feet sent a tiny shock up her shins. She had a second to assess that everything was all right before Julian plowed into her, running with both arms outstretched. Ooh. She made a sound somewhere between a grunt and an orangutan imitation. They both toppled over, Julian somehow managing to land on top of her and kick her ankle at the same time. She lay there for a moment as his body shook on top of her. She realized he was laughing. Get off me. She pushed at him, but he wouldn't budge. Her ankle was starting to throb. This was not the romantic rescue she had anticipated, and his weight was oppressive on top of her. Julian. Still suppressing laughter, he stood up and dusted off his coat. You came out of nowhere. One second, I was going to catch you, and then you were right there. He started laughing again. Marion pushed herself to her feet and limped over to her heels, not bothering to put them on. She prodded her ankle experimentally. Pain spiked through it, and she could see the swelling of a bruise already through the stocking. Definitely no way she was walking home in her heels. You better call a cab, she said, turning her back to him. I thought you wanted, call it, please. She tried to keep the tremor out of her voice. Okay. She listened to him on the phone with the driver, and then they waited in silence for the cab to arrive. Here, he said, slipping off his own shoes and kneeling down in front of her. Julian, what? He was lifting her feet and putting them into his shoes. He lifted her bruised ankle gingerly, tightening the laces, even though the shoes were nowhere near her size. Then he stood back to admire his work, wiggling his own sock-covered feet against the pavement. I look ridiculous. Marion told him, and his answering face agreed with her. He reached into his pocket, and she realized he was pulling out his phone to take a picture. Knock it off! She tried to grab the phone from him, but she could do no more than shuffle. She was shuffling, laughing, and accusing him of taking a video when the cab pulled up. Ciao, he said to the driver, opening the door and helping her inside. 
In the back seat, which smelled vaguely of airports and cigarette ash, he whispered in her ear, I had a fun time tonight. She made a non-committal sound, glancing at him. He was smiling at her. Is your ankle all right? He reached down and grabbed her legs, swinging them up onto his lap where they sat like clown feet. He was careful not to touch her ankle. I guess, she said, bending her legs so she could lean on his arm. But we didn't find our first kiss. Yet, Julian said. He turned, grabbing her chin, and kissed her. As her lips parted against his, she felt herself relaxed against her husband, smiling because only Julian would think the backseat of a taxi was the most romantic place in Rome to kiss her. Thank you. Thank you.